Up next, we have an evaluator, a national evaluator. Uh, he runs an uh, organization called uh, Basketball Illustrated Reports, and he's basically one of the premier um, evaluators in the nation. He works with Nike, and he's going to tell you guys a little bit about what is expected of um, the evaluation process, the recruiting process. Um, so that you guys are well aware of the rules that are out there, and also all the stuff that you're going to need to know as far as getting your son and or daughter or your player or whomever more, uh, more um, exposure to the next level. Um, but some of the rules are funny. Some of the things that you may hear from parents may be a little funny. Some offers may be not true, but we know, we know that you know, social media creates, uh, creates peace. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to bring up uh, Queen's finest, uh, Dave Irvin. How's everybody doing? All right. All right. Thanks everybody for coming out. Uh, we're here to talk to you a little bit about evaluating and recruiting. Um, I know you may look at me and say, well, what does he know? Uh, first things first, I'm originally from New York City, I'm born and raised in Left Right City. Um, but at, even as a kid, I played in this gym, I went to Clancy High School, before I went on to prep school. From prep school, I went on to Hampton University. From Hampton University, I went on to Chuco. Over on the Texas State. But all those travels, uh, more than anything, I definitely I, I feel that I'm qualified to do such a job. Is that every level that you the kids that you may have, I've gone through those levels. I've seen the highs, I've seen the lows. Um, sports have been a lot of great plays before me, during my time, and after me. And I was able to analyze it from that space. So when you talk about evaluating, I'm sure you all have kids of different sizes, with different backgrounds. But from a college and a collegiate standpoint, there's certain things that uh, you may enjoy it and it, it does a lot for you to win games. You also have to ask yourself, how much is this preparing them for the next level? And I think that's sometimes where things get lost in the shuffle. Because many of you guys may have a great female or all male that can play, play at a high level and score a whole lot of points. And then understand the college system is just not based on score. There are other facets to the game that they must learn how to be competitive and to be helpful in helping the program go to the next level. So with that being said, all the things that I was able to witness coming up in my own trials and tribulations with the game of basketball, I was able to apply that as an evaluator. Now, I know a lot of people say, well, why do you want to be an evaluator? Being a person of color, I'm sure some of you see this, you go to many of these events, 90, 95% players with African American background. Yet yeah, you'll look at a sideline of all the evaluators are, uh, and you really see people that look like myself or yourself. So for myself, it was, it was something that I felt instead of complaining about it, on social media ran about it, it was something I felt I wanted to stop myself. Because there's so many great people, and I take them all the time, Tom Charleston, which I'm sure a lot of you people know. Um, the thing that stuck out when he evaluated me in high school was this man was able to go anywhere in the country. He had the utmost respect for people. At the same time, he gave that respect to other people, and he just did his job. So of course, it just, it just came to me, I see all the respect that he had, and I'm saying to myself, well, why doesn't anyone that looks like me do that job? So again, I didn't complain about it. Got my little pennies together, and I started my scout service back in 2012. Um, my ability to evaluate came from Gentlemen like Charlie Brown, who was younger than me, who grew up in the same area, but seeing his recruitment at a young age and the abilities that he had, I knew I could set this aside and say, okay, look, this is one of them. Another gentleman that's sitting up, he's a pretty good player himself, Deion Jones, he was my direct peer. He had a set of abilities. So as you go on in this, in this business as, a, as an evaluator, you have to know how to pocket certain players that you see and you store them in your memory so the next time that you see someone, People want to have their opinions about their child or someone that they coach. You start to compare and contrast to yourself. And always stand by what you're looking at. But my thing is, I can meet some of you at a whole other gym and you may tell me about somebody, I'm going to hear you out, but at the same time, as an evaluator for myself, for the relationships that I have, I have to make that evaluation. I was able to establish myself. I find, I find that a lot of, a lot of people that Coaches, 
completely different. We may have somebody that plays this thing five all the way up to their 20. Guess what? They may not make it. It happens. You may get a kid that picks it up at 17 and like that, they have every school in the country calling your phone and knocking the door down and trying to get them involved. So more importantly, and it's a, it's a national question that I often find myself on both sides arguing, especially with you being a pro New York City crowd, is the space at which New York City is operating in now. And I firmly believe, and I've seen it, the girls' game, not just because there's more girls here, but the girls' game for New York City is probably in a better space than where the guy game. And at the end of the day, I think that I was explaining to Mark earlier, what probably has to stop for the guys is the comparison to the past. And the best thing I can, do, I can compare it to is to you, UCLA basketball. UCLA basketball was the Prim Della Prim, was the top of the ball, they ran off seven, eight, nine, maybe national championships in a row. Had all these great plays. And then they hit a downward spin that they haven't really recovered from. But they're always going to be compared to UCLA the past. It's the same thing with New York City basketball for the boys. When you try to look around the country, and yes, we have, we're the capital of the world. We're the media capital of the world. All the attention, if something happens here in New York City, people are going to hear about it first. But as an evaluator going across the country, and I've gone around the globe with doing this, New York is not really much buzz. And I, and I think when you compare it to the past, which sometimes can be unfair, and honestly say that is unfair, we just have to take what we have and see to it that it gets to the next level and, and just step out of there. We can't control if someone's going to be the next Lance Stevenson, Stephon Marbury, Kevin Walker, all these great guys we can't again, because the game may not be in that space again ever again. And it's, it, it is to some fault maybe of the, of the, the grounds here, but it's no fault to none of the kids. And some of these kids, as we know, they can't remember what they ate for breakfast on Thursday, let alone remember players from 10, 15, Years ago. So I think the, the best remedy for this city, especially on the guys' side, the girls keep doing what you're doing. You're doing a phenomenal job. Um, I can honestly say you put the city on your back, you probably need to get more credit for that and, and perform the way you girls perform. But the guys have to, they have to humble themselves and realize that we're not in this space and they just have to get back to work in the way that the city used to work. And I definitely think from that standpoint, from an advantage, because people always want to come to New York. Regardless of the fact, they're still going to come to these open gyms. They're going to find out what these players are available. But we have to stop comparing it to the past and just keep going forward with the future. Question? Do you think that like, coaches in New York City, like the high school coaches, get more involved? I think I'm kind of right now, compared to the city, like not compared to the past, but now, I think the high school coaches really don't care what the parents do more. Emphasis in AAU guys are really good in school. And kind of like, what's well, that's a great question, and I honestly believe, yes. So to answer your first question, yes. High school coaches should definitely stay more involved, but I also, I, I want to put some onus on the AV coaches in the club. Because I think the biggest um, slogan or saying that people say is, oh, I'm doing it for the kids. But if they're all doing it for the kids, it shouldn't matter who's getting credit, who's doing what, if you're truly doing it for the kids. Everyone should be on the same page. Because at the end of the day, you're going to have to go back to your high school coach. You're going to have to go to your AU coach. If you probably balance out the time throughout the course of the year, it's probably even. And if you have someone like you said that just wants to see some over, they wipe their hands and they're done with it, yeah, but it shouldn't be like that because it's for the progression of the kid. And I think when more AU coaches and high school coaches work together, it's for the betterment truly of that child because they're going to need that, that help. I, I, I was fortunate, I played with Artie Cox, who was assistant coach at Christ and King. I still talk to Artie to this day. I still talk to him to this day. Coach Kent, that was in my class, and he did all day. I still keep in contact with him like him. My personal coach. I, so it's no, it's no, well, the cloud chasing of, well, I was here for this, and I did this, and Georgia Tech came in my gym, and UConn. No, it's not about that, because it's for the kid. And parents, I challenge any of you that if you don't see that, to try to bridge that in relationship, and if they don't want to bridge it, then that's the conversation that needs to be had. Because there's no reason, there's no reason whatsoever why they're not on the same page. Again, I watched Charlie Brown as he came up as a kid, and I remember some of the home business that he had. He had his AAU coach there, he had his high school coach there. And it was more so, Grilling the Mike Jarvis of the world, Jim Calvin of the world, all these people that were recruiting them, 
because they wanted the best for him. It wasn't about St. John's Prep. It wasn't about any kind of aid program. It was about Tally Brown. So, again, that wasn't part of my, my nurturing and my process of growing to the space that I'm in now and understanding, again, the different levels of understanding the recruiting. And that's another thing, even part of that's another part of your question. Some of the schools that may reach out to your kids that are here, like, you have to have that real talk conversation. Not just on the phone, not when they won't come to the city, not when they won't take you to dinner, but the real conversation of, is my child a player, whoever it is, are they the number one option? When you take anyone before him, those priority questions are important because I'll be the first to tell you, all the boys that I deal with believe nothing they say. And that may sound contradictory, but I'm saying, don't believe nothing they say. Believe in every action that they put forward. They're going to tell you any and everything on the phone. They're going to tell you any and everything on an unofficial, official visit. But some of you, when you set the parameters, which I, I, I encourage all of you to do, you set the parameters and let them know, listen, we only take the phone calls Sunday from 2 to 6. How many of those coaches are going to follow those rules? Because if, if you let them do it, some of you may have some new, you know, recruits coming up, and how do you really have some of the and singles? But if you set those parameters, those that violate the parameters, they they don't care nothing about you or your child. Because if you gave them a simple time limit, that they will, they will monopolize your time. You'll sit on the phone with a coach for one hour, next you know you just spoke to five coaches, you're going to for five hours. Half your day long. So if you set those parameters and those coaches stick by it, then you know you deal with real coaches. Then you go a little further, not to the point where it becomes abusive, but they're respecting your time. They're respecting your child's time to do more, your child to be in the gym, things of that nature, and that's how you build that relationship to the point where you can ask them, how some, how early will my child come into your university? Can my child come into your university? There's a new game that I see on social media as well. It's the whole offer game. But a lot of times when schools may offer your child, your child can't come into that school. That right there lets you know something as well as that you just throw it out there because maybe a coach is running in the room or your high school coach. No. Any offer that your child gets extended to them across their table, they should be able to admit to it right there on the spot. You should be able to hang up the phone, go there two, three days later, and commit on the spot. And it's real. But when they go and you want to hold up or you want to talk, then that's when you know it wasn't real. Because I think some of our kids, and that's part of the game, they're as tainted and it can be in the better spaces. They hear the offers, they come to the gym. And who's this offer coming from? Because a lot of times, if it's real, it's coming from the head coach. If the head coach is extending that offer, then it, he has no one to check with. There's nothing to double back with. But if it's an assistant coach, the head assistant, second assistant, he still got to run that by the head coach. So it's, it, it's good to understand the levels in which you have to go through with recruiting to understand where your child, where their position is at. Because again, the goal should be going to college for free. And that's what you can ask for. Any other questions? I mean, where does the accountability of fixing that process lie? The accountability of fixing the uh, process where there's like semi-committable offers, where like some coaches may be and somebody on the staff may not you know, feel the same way. Well, when, when you realize, so let's just use it in the, in the ranking sense, if it's the last assistant that has sent that offer, and you know that pecking order, so I, I mean, excuse my ignorance on the women's side, I'll give you the men's side. So at Syracuse, you got Jeff Ahan, he's the head coach. Adrian Autry, he's a head assistant. Third is Jerry McNamara. Fourth, is Alan Griffin. If you have a player, and Alan Griffin extends that offer, because that's, that's important in every university, every school is different, but it's, it's important to know that order of a staff. Because who it's coming from, you know, because your head coach know about it. So if Alan extends that offer to me and my son, Alan, can we commit right now? Oh, sure. Well, so I go to social media with this. I can call Jerry Myers, I can call Evan Daniels, all the national bloggers and put it out there to my son committed. They get to stutter it. Then that's when you have to have a, a, an adult conversation. You step away from basketball and say, why are we playing this game? I'm a man just like you are. This is a serious moment for my child, the same player. Might be one of your players that, like, you don't take this lightly. Now, if Jerry McNamara that's, that's a step up. And uh, Adrian Arthur is to step up. But the moment you start hearing from Jim Ahon, he don't have to go to the AD. He's the head coach. So now those conversations are a little bit different, and then you know who to push to the side and you know what I'm going to talk to the head coach. 
So, so it's holding that accountability. Anytime you get that from any said school, does your head coach know about this? And I talk to the head coach. Can we commit right now? Those are the conversations that you have. And then, then again, if the stuttering is to happen and the excuses start to come in, then you know not to take them that seriously. Because that other school that you have that did it, they ready to go there with it. They got the news right on, on speed dial. You know that's more serious. So now you have to make a decision. Do I take this because this is what it's about? And, and I don't know if you work on the girl's side or the men's side. It, it's, it's different because I think on the girls' side, which I salute them for, like they value it more. You see girls going to the academic institutions that the education goes a long way. That when they commit, they commit and they want to get that education. Like it, it hurts me because on the men's side, I mean, let's be for real, Zion Williams said what to do for a year, but he can win anything. So it's just another, another time of conversation that I always have that nobody just didn't go to South Carolina State. What's, what's wrong with going to the HBC? You can do on pro anyway. You're going there for a year. It didn't matter. On the boys' side, by the time they become seniors, most guys in the big down on America, Grand Jordan, there's so many NBA personnel, they know if they're a pro. So it doesn't matter where you go. So the kids that are running up, they, they can go anywhere in the country. But you still have many people that would argue that all of a sudden. You're not there for the facility. You need to show your ability. Your ability is what it is. It doesn't matter who you play against. And then what's really killing that is that for the last five years, you've had five guys who didn't go nowhere and still were drafted. And only one of them, which is Rich Robinson from the Knicks, he's the only one that didn't go in the first round. Manny Moulier, Terrence Ferguson, this past year, he had Terrence Basin. They didn't go anywhere. A couple going over to Australia. Terrence Basin worked out for an entire year in Boston, signed with New Balance, still a first round. So that goes to show you it doesn't matter where you go. But in understanding, and you said accountability that you want to hold to a university, those are the conversations you can have. So when people reach out to you all the time, and they know you, you have a bevy of players over the years, I'm sure you've developed that rapport with certain schools where you can have that conversation. Because it's just not something to run the Twitter for, because this is someone's life. It's going to help shape someone's life. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, it's actually a great point. Oh, sorry.
Absolutely. Even if you're a coach and you're only going to places where you're going to be able to buy a team with a school or program, I don't know what the man needs to do. He wasn't making much money. I'm not going to say how much, but you know, you can tell them before, like, don't be afraid to spend your own money to get the places to learn and be involved and be around. You know, I'm not saying that you're going to be able to get the places to learn and be involved and be around. Well, that, that, that's, a, that's a great point, and um, to expand on what you're saying, this right here, boy, you guys seriously coming out, we definitely appreciate the coach wins and everything he's doing with footprints, but giving yourselves a hand because, as he's saying, in this industry, not only do good people find good people, just as bad people find bad people, but the investment that you're putting in yourself to expand your mind in the game of basketball, it's going to take you that much further. Um, and don't stop here. Like, find a way to go to the final four. I'm always, he'll tell you all the time, the young players that come about, I always have one for them that they need some to lay their head, want to get a meal somewhere. I'm always looking to help people that came behind me, especially from New York, because we have to help each other. But you have to invest in yourself as well. You have to go that extra mile sometime, whether it's getting the car ride in Philly, going up to Boston, just to do the job at stake, and again, not looking at the financial reward for it. You can't approach, I think in any job, you can't just approach it where uh, I'd be worried about the money. Because there's very few actual jobs that's going to make you rich. Not a career, but there's very few jobs, whether it's retail, whether it's working, it's not going to make you rich. So at the end of the day, you have to find a way to invest in yourself to things where you're in a bigger group. If it's, let's just say it's 30 of us here, you've got to find a way to get to a bigger clinic that may have 75. From there, you want to go to one that may have 200. And again, I always tell people because it's, it's the biggest and the coaches profession for both men and women. And even in my case, I'll be at home. This year, the men's final four is in Atlanta. Women's is in the walls. I will find my way. I'm going to be in Atlanta for five, six days. Have to network what I have to do. And I don't care. I've done it with them before where I get on the mega bus. And I'll ride the mega bus from Atlanta straight to the walls. And this is what I did have. I, I, was, I wasn't fortunate. I mean, the hurdles I had to go through as a black man in the scouting industry without ESPN, Yahoo, Rivals. If I told you I was going to get out of line, but it's just many of the hurdles you have to go through. And it's something that I wanted to do, and I was able to do it. I, I persevered through it, and I was able to reach great heights. And I'm still, I'm, I'm not even nowhere near where I want to be. But investing in yourself, getting to those type of events, and it's simple because to give you any, have any of you not been to the front of or have been to the front of Men's final four. It is simple because at the end of the day, like I said, it's the biggest coaches. Uh, I don't want to say workshop, but pretty much so. It, like every coach in America is there, and they're just walking around, having a good time, and meeting other coaches. They sit down and they watch the game. But it's your opportunity if you're young and what you want to do, you know, you focus on it to make that introduction to that particular coach. Now I'll be the first to tell you, you won't. Good job. On the men's side, they, they don't have that understood just yet for whatever reason. It, it's if Jim Bayhan gets fired at Syracuse and Mark gets a job. Everyone takes Mark down at the final for Mark, man, I'm such such, I want a job. He's not hiring nobody at the final four. But I tell you what they are doing, and this happens on both the men's and women's side. They're watching. They know some of the programs you come from, the high school, they may have seen you in an open gym or in the summertime, they're watching. So where they may not give you a job, but they're watching, hey, he's smell like Papa, what is he doing? I did see him standing on the top of the bar top last night, what is he doing? Or, man, I see him having a nice dinner last night, he came over and introduced himself, he got himself well together, and we had an 8 o'clock clinic in the morning, he's here, and coaches take notes. That's what they do at the front of them. they take notes. So when they take those notes, and then the opportunity may present itself where a job opportunity or something's available, they're going to go back in their mind and where did I meet this person? Oh yeah, I met him in New Orleans. He was at Razzles, we were sharing frog legs, whatever. They remember those type of things. So never ever sell yourself short if you have the opportunity to do some of those things. Um, definitely look into it. Okay. Your advice is great, because I want to put something out there. There are informal interviews that take place at the final four. Yes. On the women's side, I'll speak to the women's yeah, side. Absolutely. They're not where you think. You'll walk through a lobby and you'll see an AD and somebody sitting, and when you're going up the escalator, you link two and two together. Or you're in Starbucks and you're buying a coffee and a croissant. There's interviews going on around you, but you've got to kind of be in the know. 
Yep, you got absolutely. To know. That's very true. And on the men's side, I, I, I would agree with that as well. There are informal interviews, but I, I'm also looking at when people hear job open and they think they see it, oh, this is my shot. It don't work out. It really does not work out. And, and, don't, and don't be discouraged. I'm, I'm also saying it because I don't want you to be discouraged that if you go and you run into Don Stanley or you run into anyone, Coach K, Shopping Smart, don't feel discouraged. If you go up, introduce yourself, something may be available, and they like just walk off. Like, that's just not the setting. It's just more of introduce yourself, I think you get familiar with you, and, and you grow from there. You might get an email address, make it a phone number. But you can make those weekends a productive weekend for yourself in this industry and really grow from there. Any other questions? Come in. Uh, you talked about New York boys basketball, football, the high times. As an evaluator, what are specific skills or traits that New York doesn't seem to have with other places that college is Well, I think, I think one of the, one of the hang-ups, so I was born in 78, so I came up in the 80s, early 90s. Many of the great teachers that we had, that I had, have passed on. Guys like Leslie Mans, who was in the East Elmhurst, St. Gabriel's area over there. Um, Vincent Smith, Vinnie Smith's brother, who he taught a bevy of us. He no longer lives in New York. Um, yep. uh, Gil Reynolds was in Brooklyn. He had Bernard King, Albert King, uh, Finney Johnson. He had John Sally. He had a bunch of people. He passed away. Um, I mean, after that, it's out to make it. He had a bunch of people. But the people that they taught are no longer here. You know, many of their many of their, their tools to us was to get out your neighborhood, to get out the park, get out your high school, and then go into New Heights. Not necessarily purposely to leave New York behind, but to, to go on to a better quality of life, because many of us work in tough areas. Well, that created that that created a void. Because many of the people that they taught, you can run down a list of people that they have. None of them returned to New York. So then it, it left a gap. And, and not, believe it or not, the, the, the falling and the crumbling of, of Riverside Church and Gallup Church, that's, probably, that's been a huge, a huge void for New York. Because you had two foundations where really, when you, when you fare with it, had the, 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 the strongest concentration of talent in a system, in a program that just crumbled. So I always compared that the basketball gods took those two foundations and they slammed it on the ground and then it all cracked to different programs. Got New Heights, got PSA, got New York Lightning, got Friends. All those programs didn't exist 20 years ago. And it's different people with different philosophies, with different motives. Some people want to pay their players to get them. I don't condone that. Some people want to, you know, badger them to no end, want to work them out to no end. That's the right. Some people want to go about it old school way. And because there's so many different philosophies and now there's more teams, it's now become almost a over, not, it's become, they want to be well one too many times. And it's just not, it's not being a chance to reproduce on itself to get back to that strong concentration. You know, people always say, oh, there's too many teams. I'm in Texas and I, and I promise you, Every mom and dad that got money, they want their own team. The last year was the last year they were going to Vegas. And the 17 other divisions alone, there was 116 teams in the state of Texas. 116, that's just 17, that's not 16, 15. The moment someone gets with a known Houston Hoops, Drive Nation, Pro Skills, Dallas Mustangs, any of those different known programs, the moment something does not go right in the state of Texas, that parent is their own program or the money got steps on, which I'll be the first to tell you all, all you guys, please be, be cautious of that. Be very cautious of that, because I think basketball is the only industry the moment somebody has money and they say they want to get involved, they let them walk to the front of the line. No questions asked. Yet there's no background checks. We don't know if they're sex offenders, pedophiles, we don't know. But because they're the quote unquote money guy, they're willing to pay for everything, they're willing to take it to Vegas, Orlando, California, we left it to the front of the line. I have no doubt in my mind if Tali Brown won a national championship at UConn, made down all of America, played professional for years, if he literally wanted to start it at, at level one with some kids, he could get more backlash than anybody. But they could be a pedophile from Wyoming that moved to New York. He's a billionaire, getting around all the kids all the time. 
And I think our system has that bad. They have that, that it's just too bad. I'm sure you all have your own stories of how do you get involved? And then it comes out later and it's molesting kids and like, oh, that was the money guy. So I think, going back to answer your, your question again, so many people got involved with the game here in New York. It's all over the place. And not for nothing, many of those that were great, including myself. Like I have a New York State of mind, I have a New York mentality, but my kids are going to be from Texas. So they may come up with a New York style of play. And people may see them, man, he got a he got a game that's, you know, reminiscent to a New York style of play, but he's from Texas. That's happening all over the place. You got people from New York that they live in other places that their child play like Jamie Springer, one of the top 20 players in the country, for Boy Scout. His dad played uh, Iowa. Gary Springer. Maybe Jim Bob Bell before he went to SC State. His son plays like a New York City guard, but his son grew up in North Carolina. If you was to take him out of North Carolina and put him in ISA, any local event, he would play in like a regular New York City kid. But he's in another place. So that's like kind of a classic example of what I'm saying. And it's so many guys that know the game. It's in a college game since he's not in New York anymore. I mean, have yeah, a question? I'm just going to uh, support what you say. New York City basketball is no longer in New York, it's in Texas. David Britton, whatever TV guy, mm -hmm. he's in North Carolina. I was in North Carolina with the God of the Wayne West, he's from Harlem. So there's New York City basketball outside of New York. Absolutely. And it's alive and well. Too. Yep, absolutely. There, there's no question about it. I mean, I always want to say that I see a kid just with a certain pop to his game, even a female with a certain swag to her game. I wouldn't doubt if they had no I did not know. But Ben Simmons is dad is too. Ben Simmons dad is too.
to make sure that they express their opinion in a way that they want. But again, when you have analytics, that takes that out of the equation. Payola can't answer why this guy turns it over every third time down the floor. Well, this person that they sit on the bench is one of the best shooters, her or whatever they're using it as, and he's not playing. So when you are making that argument for your favorite player, boy or girl, you take that emotion out when you allow the athlete to do it. So now I'm just, I'm just touching on that. I think it's more so in today's game, kids per se, they're more so caught up with ranking rather than getting better. No, that's true. That's very true. And, that, that, and it's unfortunate, like this time of year, we're, we're approaching the early signing period, and I hate to see it when, my man, what's your name? Kelly. Kelly, Kelly can be recruited by every group of blood Duke, North Carolina, Kansas, your name. And then your name is Kendall. They're on the same team. Kendall may not have that, but she has the St. John's, the St. Syracuse, St. Paul, Villanova. And then you're the third team, what's your name? Tess. Tess. Tess is getting recruited by Stony Brook, St. Peter's. And she's a pretty good player, though. But she'll rush with her decision because she sees Kelly announcement on social media. She's seen Kim's announcement on social media. So she feels, oh, I gotta, I gotta go. No. I tell any of you, with your child, everyone is different on your team. Take your time. Because my thing is, if St. Peter's and those schools are there at, at now, but you're possibly better than Kim, you will get one and you will receive one. Now, if that's all you have and that's all you want, cool, go ahead and check the commitment and be done with it. But social media has had that effect, again, with the fake offers and then the pressures of people doing these announcements on videos and walking into the gym and cutting lights on. Listen, everybody, all eggs don't have to the same thing. I say that all the time.